Good morning, beautiful children. Welcome back from spring break. The last time we read Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim before spring break, we learned how Nicodemus and Jenner and other rats were captured by a scientist named Dr. Schultz and how he and all of the other rats are now in the laboratory called Nim. Today, our chapter is called The Maze. During the days that followed, our lives fell into a pattern, and the reason for our captivity gradually became clear. Dr. Schultz was a neurologist, that is, an expert on brains and nerves intelligence and how people learn things. He hoped, by experimenting on us, to find out whether certain injections could help us to learn more and faster. The two younger people working with him, George and Julie, were graduate students in biology. Watch always, he told them, for signs of improvement, faster learning, quicker reaction in group A as compared to group B, and both as compared to the control group. My own training began on the day after the first injections. It was George who did it. I suppose Julie and Dr. Schultz were doing the same test on the other rats. He took my cage from the shelf and he carried it to another room, similar to the first room, but with, with more equipment in it and no shelves of cages. He placed the cage in a slot against the wall, slid open the end, opened the matching door on the wall, and I was free, or, I, or so I thought. The small doorway in the hall led to a short corridor or hallway, which opened, or it seemed to, directly onto a green lawn. I could see it clearly, and behind it there were some bushes, and behind them a street, all outdoors and nothing but air between me and them. Furthermore, I could smell the fresh air, outdoor breeze blowing in. Were they going to let me go? I made a quick dash toward the open end of the corridor, and then I jumped back. I could not go. About two feet from my cage, still open behind me, there was something dreadfully wrong with the floor. When I touched my feet to it, Terrible prickling feelings came up over my skin. My muscles cramped, my eyes blurred, and I got instantly dizzy. I never got used to that feeling. No one ever does. But I did experience it many times and eventually learned what it was. It was an electric shock. It is not exactly a pain, but it is very unbearable. Yet as I was in a frenzy to reach that open lawn, to run for the bushes and get away from this cage, I tried again. I jumped back again. There was no use. And then I saw, leading off to the left, another corridor. I had not noticed it at first because I had not been looking so eagerly. Or I had not noticed it at first because I had been looking so eagerly at the open end of the one that I was in. Now the second one seemed to stop about five feet away from the blank wall. Yet there was a light there. It must be a corner. I ran down cautiously, not trusting the floor. At the end, it turned right, and there was the lawn again. Another opening. I got closer that time. Then, just as I thought I was going to make it, another shock. I pulled back, and I saw that there was still another corridor leading off to the right. Again, I ran. Again, I saw the open escape hole, and again, I was stopped by shock. This was a repeated to me over and over, yet each time I seemed to get a little closer to freedom. But when finally I reached it and the grass was only just a step away, bam, a wire wall snapped down in front of me, another behind me, the ceiling opened above me and a gloved hand reached in and picked me up. A voice said, hmm, four minutes, 37 seconds. It was George talking. I had, after all, all of my running through the corridors emerged into a trap only a few feet away from where I had started, and through a concealed opening up above, George had been watching everything that I had done. I had been in what is now called a maze, you know, a device to test intelligence and memory. I was put in it many times again and again, and so were all the other rats. The second time I got through it a little faster, because I remembered to some extent which tor corridors or which hallways had electric floors and which did not. 
The third time, I was still faster, and after each trial, George, or sometimes Julie or Dr. Schultz, would write down how long it took me. You might ask, why would I bother to run through all of that if I knew that it was only a trick? Well, the answer is I couldn't help it. When you've lived in a cage and you can't bear not to live in it one more moment, you run, even if what you're running toward is just an illusion. There were more injections and the other kinds of tests too, and some of these were more important than the maze, because the maze was designed only to find out how quickly we could learn, while some of the others actually taught us things, or at least led us up to actual teaching. One was this. One was what Dr. Schultz called the shape recognition. We would be put into a small room with three doors leading out, a round door, a square door, and a tri triangular door. The doors were on hinges with springs that held them shut, but they were easy to open, and each door led to another room with three more doors, just like the first one. But the trick was this. If you went through the wrong door, the room you entered had an electric floor and you got a shock, so you had to learn. In the first room, you used the round door, in the second room, the triangle, and so on. All of these activities helped us to pass the time, and the weeks went by quickly, but they did not lessen our longing to get away. I wished for my old home in the sewer. I wished I could see my mother and my father and run with my brother to the marketplace. I know all the others felt the same way, yet it seemed as hopeless as ever. Still, there was one rat who decided to try to get away anyway. He was a young rat, probably the youngest of all that had been caught, and by chance he was in the cage next to mine. I might mention that, like Jenner and me, he was in group in the group that Dr. Schultz called Group A. His name was Justin. It was late one night that I heard him calling to me, speaking softly around the wooden partition between our cages. The partitions generally kept all of us from going, getting to know each other very well, as we might have done if they weren't there. And it discouraged us from talking much to one another. It was quite hard to hear around them, and of course you could never see the one that you were talking to. I do think Dr. Schultz had purposely done that to made, and made them soundproof. But you could hear if you and your neighbor got to the very corners of the cage nearest each other and spoke out through the wire front. Nicodemus! Yes? I went over to the corner. How long have we been here? You mean since the beginning? Since we were caught? Yes. I don't know. Several months. I think, but I have no way to keep track. I know. I don't either. Do you suppose it's winter outside? Probably. Or maybe late fall. Ooh, it will be cold, but not in here, I said. No, but I'm going to try to get out anyway. Get out? But how? Your cage is shut. Tomorrow, we get injections, so they'll open it up, and when they do, I'm going to run. Run where? I don't know. At least I'll get a look around. There might be some way out. What can I lose? Well, you might get hurt. Oh, I don't think so. Anyway, they won't hurt me. By they, he meant Dr. Schultz and the other two. He added confidently, All those shots and all the time they've spent, we're too valuable to them now. They'll be careful. That idea had not occurred to me before, but when I thought about it, I decided that he was right. Dr. Schultz, Julie, and George had spent most of their working hours with us for months. They could not afford to let him come to any harm, but on the other hand, neither could they afford to allow us to escape. Justin made his attempt the next morning, and it did cause a certain amount of excitement, but not at all what we expected. It was Julie who opened Justin's cage with a hyperdemic needle in her hand. Justin was out with a mighty leap. He hit the floor, which was about four feet down, with a thump. He shook himself off and he ran, disappearing from view, heading toward the other end of the room. Julie seemed not at all alarmed. She calmly placed the needle on the shelf. Then she walked to the door of the laboratory and pushed a button on the wall near it. A red light came over the door. 
She picked up a notebook and a pencil from the desk near the door and followed Justin just out of my sight. A few minutes later, Dr. Schultz and George entered. They opened the door cautiously and he closed it behind. The outer door is shut too, said Dr. Schultz. Where is it? Down here, said Julie, inspecting the air. Down here, said Julie. He's inspecting the air ducts. Really? Which one is it? Oh, it's the A group. Just as you expected, number nine. I'm keeping notes on it. Obviously, the red light was some kind of a warning. Both outside the door and in. Laboratory animal on the escape. And not only had Dr. Schultz known one of us was, uh, not only had Dr. Schultz known one of us was out, but he expected it to happen. A few days sooner than I thought, he was saying, but so much for the better. Do you realize? Look, said Julie, he's doing the whole baseboard thing. He is studying the windows too. See how he steps back and he's looking up? Of course, said Dr. Schultz. And at the same time, he's watching us too. Can't you see that? Ooh, he's pretty cool about it, said George. Can you imagine one of the lab rats doing that? Or even one of the controls? Well, we've got to try to grasp what we have on our hands. The A group is now 300% ahead of the control group in learning and getting smarter every day. B group is only 20% ahead. It's the new DNA that's doing it. We have a real breakthrough, and since it is the DNA, we may very well have a true mutation. Why a brand new species of rat? But we've got to be careful with it. I think we should go ahead now with the next injection series. Steroids? Whatever that was. Yes, it may slow them up just a little, though I doubt it. But even if it does, it will be worth it because I'm betting it will increase their lifespan by double at least. Maybe more. Maybe much more. Look, said Julie, A9 has made a discovery. He's found the mice, George said. See how he's studying them? Probably, Dr. Schultz said wirely. He's wondering if they're ready for their steroid injections, too. As a matter of fact, I think that the G group is. They're doing almost as well as the A group. Should I get the net and put him back? George asked. Um, I doubt that you'll need it, Dr. Schultz said. Now that he's learned what he can't, now that he's learned that he can't get out. But do you know what? They were underestimating Justin. He had learned no such thing. And so that is the end of the chapter for this morning. And think about it. Now we know that the scientists are um, trying to see if they can increase the rat's intelligence, which kind of makes sense thinking about what we know about the rats in their home in the rose bush and reading and all those different types of things. Fascinating. Also, it was interesting that they, uh, that Justin, when he escaped, found mice. I wonder how that is going to connect them to Mr. Frisbee. So, um, as you have uh, been listening to this, can you make a prediction about the next chapter? The next chapter is called A Lesson in Reading. So using what you've learned today in the reading, can you make a prediction? What do you think they're going to, how do you think they're going to learn how to read? Because it says a lesson in reading. What do you think is going to happen? Write me three or four sentences about that, and I will see you tomorrow. Have a wonderful day, and welcome back. I missed you guys.